G'day folks, it's DIY Guy 123 here bringing you another do-it-yourself video. Today I've got a Walker, actually this is a Peerless uh, 1050 gearbox. It takes power from one angle and converts it 90 degrees out the other angle. So this kind of a housing is very common in uh, lots of different things, but certainly this one is out of a, an industrial Walker mower. And this is a big ride-on commercial job. If you see this shaft assembly here, there are three blades on this Walker mower. There's one there, where there'd be a blade there. And then that the gearbox I've got off here, uh, I'm gonna show you, you know, basically the disassembly and the inspection and the reassembly. Now what happened was the operator hit something hard, a rock, we think, and it, really came to such an abrupt stop that it fractured two teeth off of this gear right here that's inside this gearbox. Certainly those teeth, uh, you know, pretty important. And the operator shut off immediately, which is super smart because it, it did only minimal other damage to the expensive shafts. We did need to get a new pair of gears, new set of gears, because when you replace one used gear, the new gear will wear excessively quick and it will just accelerate the overall wear in the two gears. So. If you're replacing one gear that mates with another, you should replace them both. And they came in as, as a packet of two. Um, but fortunately, the shaft wasn't damaged. There were some bearings that need to be replaced, and I damaged the seal. I was, it was leaking anyway. And so this is going to be a disassembly video and then a inspection reassembly video. Here we go. Okay, so there are definitely several gotchas that I want to tell you so that if you're in this job, you don't make, you know, Kind of critical mistakes that could cost you a lot of money first thing is when you go to take this apart check out the orientation of these shafts now see there's a flat spot right there and the same on the other side that's how the blade mat mates onto this and the blade will only go on one way well this way or 180 degrees so that would mean the blade is in this orientation and notice how this and this and this are all in line which would mean that if the blades were short enough to not interfere, like if these two blades were short enough to not interfere with each other as they're spinning, that would potentially leave a small little sliver of grass if the blades wore a bit on the end or you got the engine was slowed down just due, due to load or maybe the grass was a bit wet or long, you could end up with a little sliver of grass that doesn't get cut that goes between these two blades. So what do they do? They make this blade come more than halfway over here and this blade more than halfway over here. What does that mean? Well, it means you have to synchronize these gearboxes when you put them back together. And if you don't pay attention to that, what could happen is as this spins around, your blades will hit each other. And certainly that could be catastrophic for the gearbox damaging the blades. So I just point this out. If you look at this one, and I haven't disturbed these two, it's in this direction. This one is now in this direction. And when I put this one back together, it's gonna to be in this direction so that the three blades don't interfere with each other. All right, the next thing I'll tell you is there's a pin right here, and that, I think, should be a cotter pin, and I feel it should have sheared, or a shear pin, not a cotter pin, sorry. It should have sheared when this hard, uh, you know, whatever it was, the rock was, was hit, but it didn't shear. It did bend a little bit, and so I'm kind of bothered by that. I think that, and it is an actual, you know, proper pin. It's not like a grade 8 bolt that somebody put there, but I'm going to have to call the dealer to find out if that's really supposed to be there or not. Um, okay, so when it comes to disassembling, uh, basically the gearbox looked just like this one, and we knew it was the we knew that which one was the problem because we took off this little cover right here, four little screws to take it off, and we could see the broken teeth in there. So to get these covers off, there's or the, these gearboxes off, there's one, two, three, four bolts that come out, and then it will slide off in this angle. And you'll see a little collar right in there. Well, that's a toothed collar that the shaft goes into, and then you get the gearbox in your hand. Okay, now looking at this diagram, uh, and this is a Peerless Gearbox 1050-005, but I think the last three digits, the dash 005, is kind of irrelevant. I think all the 1050s are the same. To get it apart, you're first gonna take this cover off, the gasket comes off with the cover, there's a snap ring that's on the top of a shaft. When you take that off, this gear comes off and there's a bearing that is shown here. That didn't fall out for me right away. I, um, 
I needed to do a little bit of extra work to get that out. I'll show you in a minute. And then on the bottom side of the gearbox, there's a snap ring and then a lock washer, which wasn't on mine, but did come that way from the factory. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then a seal and a larger snap ring to get this bearing out. Now, that shaft was attached to the bearing through this circlip. So it's a little hard to understand, but I'm gonna try and show you, um, you know, step by step how it comes apart. Okay, so I just quickly put it this together just to show you the disassembly process. So remember, we've, we've taken these four bolts off, which, uh, sorry, we took these four bolts off, which got the gear housing away from the, the other connecting shaft. We slid it off of that little collar right here. And now we're faced with what do we do to get all this out? Well, there is a snap ring right in there that keeps the gear from sliding forward on the shaft. If you reach in with some, here's the snap ring, I got it off. Reach in with some pliers or uh, snap ring pliers that have an angle to them. You can squeeze it and move that snap ring this way on the shaft. When you do that, that will allow you to pull this whole shaft out. And when it comes out, the bearing will be forced to come with it because there's a, well, no, sorry, the bearing may stay in the housing, but in any case, they come apart just like this. And so now you've got your bearing and shaft out. And when you slide that shaft out, this gear will come out too. And so now you're faced with, there's a bearing that's Now you're faced with the gear down here. There's another snap ring, a small one, that goes around that shaft to hold that gear in place. And so I've already got that little snap ring out. And with that snap ring out, this gear should come off. Gravity will help if you can do that. The gear will come off, okay, so there's that. And now you're looking at a bearing that might be difficult to get out right now. You can just leave that alone for the moment. Then you're looking at this end, well, Take this nut off. This is the nut that went on the end of the lawnmower shaft. You can't just get the seal out. You have to take this very large snap ring out first. Snap ring comes out. Then there's a washer that the diagram shows is covering the seal to protect it. In our case, the washer wasn't there. Why would that be? Well, And you'll see a little hole, right? Well, not that little, actually. I drove a punch, a sharper punch than this, drive it in through the seal, and then drive it in this direction. And while you're doing that, kind of pry the seal up. Now, I saw another video where a guy drills a hole and puts a little metal screw in, and he can pry it up. I think that's pretty smart. He did less damage to the seal than I did. And he said, you know, if I want to reuse it, I can just put some RTV silicone on it to seal up that hole and then reuse the seal later. I don't put used seals back in when I take something apart. I never want to do it twice, so I don't take the chance. I put a new seal in for, well, I don't know what the cost was, but it wasn't a lot of money. New seal there. So let's get this seal back out of here because I've already had it out. Okay, so the seal comes out. The whole shaft won't come out until you take this other large snap ring out. Once you do that, the bearing in the shaft should come out. There we go. So the bearing in the shaft come out, came out. And yes, there are two snap rings to hold that in there. So basically that's everything disassembled. Now you want to check over, for one thing, you want to check the seal, the surface that your seal runs against. Now in this case, it's probably hard to see from the camera, but the seal normally runs right up tight to there. But I think what happened was this might've leaked in the past and when the person reinstalled a new seal, they didn't push it down all the way on the sh in the housing on purpose, so it ride in a different place in the shaft that was clean and not corroded. Um, so I don't know the history on this, but I suspect that's why that was done. And so when I put this back in, I'm going to uh, not drive the seal in, you know, all the way. I think that I think that I'm going to just follow the lead of the previous person that was in there and have that seal ride just a little bit up from the area that, uh, that, it, that the original one was intended to run in. So then when it comes to checking the bearings, you know, this one had broken teeth off a of gear and dirt and debris in there. And this actual, this bearing in my hand is the lowest one in the whole gear case. So all the debris would always settle and go through this bearing. Now, 
to check a bearing, you, I mean, if it spins like this by hand and you don't feel any lumps and bumps and, and gouges in the bearing races, that's good, but you first need to clean it. So clean it with brake fluid, or sorry, brake cleaner, clean all the bearings, spin them, use some compressed air to blow it out, always wear your eye protection. And one thing a lot of people like to do is they take compressed air and get this bearing spinning, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of RPMs, and without any lubricant in there, that's very damaging to the races and they can heat up. So don't do that. When I say use compressed air to clean it, I'm talking about drive the compressed air in this way, not like this to cause it to spin. Now, I may, in fact, use some, some small angle to cause this to rotate slowly, just so that I can clean all the balls with the compressed air, but I'm definitely not causing that to spin thousands of RPMs with compressed air. So, to, to, so you've cleaned them, you're with brake cleaner, you've blown it out to get all the brake cleaner and debris out of there, and then lightly oil with a thin oil, uh, silicon lube or something like that and spin them and that's the condition they need to be in when you go to check them now this one is completely dry and it's pooched I don't have any light oil in this because even if it ran quiet with light oil I uh, I'm gonna replace it when I roll it like this it actually binds at spots the rest of the bearings were okay but I don't know if you can hear this one anyway that's a dead giveaway that this one is all done so we bought a new bearing and a new seal and I'm gonna get to work putting that in so for the output shaft, I'm actually replacing this bearing. And so to get it off the shaft, it doesn't want to just come off. So I'm going to drop it in the vise and give it a little tappy tap. Now I've put the nut back on the shaft to keep the thread safe. need to take a snap ring off before that would come off. Now this bearing is hard to come off at that end and I'm pretty sure it's because the blade wear on the flat surface of the shaft over time has caused that shaft to mushroom a bit. So I may have to file that a bit before I put the new one on. There it goes. So I'm just going to show you the difference between a new bearing and an old bearing. Here's the new one, brand new out of the box. And the old one, remember the noise? And here's the new one. No noise, no side to side, well, a little bit side to side, but no noise. Okay, so let's get that back on there. And I wanna see, I definitely wouldn't be pushing too hard to get that on without filing, but I'd prefer not to file that. So I'm just gonna give it a few taps. Not loving how that's going on. Okay, so I did end up filing just the edges off right here, just a little bit uh, with a very fine file. And, um, I'm, and I had to press the bearing back on the shaft and now I'm reinstalling the, the snap ring right there and it should snap in place just like that and once it's in place usually snap rings are loose there's a little bit of play in them but anyway even if it wasn't it wouldn't bother me but there generally is so that's that part while we've got room to work i'm actually going to put this inner bearing deep inside of this first and so it's all clean and the housing is super clean and I'm going to, I've got a socket that is slightly smaller than the diameter of the outside of the outer race. And you may just press that in. Okay, so after much fooling, I figured this was the best solution. I've got a 30 mil socket, but the, a lot of people don't know you can do this, but you just take the extension, put it in backwards, and now you have a nice flat surface as opposed to this sharper, more narrow surface. So anyway, I turn it up, put it upside down, put it on the, on the race in there, put this in basically 
like that and pressed it in with the vise and it went in pretty easy. You could pound it in if you needed to, but I was like to press stuff in a controlled way rather than pounding. So that, I put that in just cause that's kind of easy to get in right now. Now I'm gonna start working on this end of things. So again, every time you start uh, working with a part you to reassemble, make sure it's always clean and I've had kind of some mess around here. So I'll stop, tidy everything up and then I'll get back at it. Okay, so it's time to put that bearing in there in this guy right here. So we'll put them in flat. And then I've got a one and five sixteenths socket, which is bigger than the bearing, but smaller than the, the bore that the bearing fits in. Interestingly enough, this bearing doesn't go all the way in to the bore. I've not observed that before. Usually the bearings go right up to where the bore, like basically it's bored down and you drive the bearing down until it's flush. But this one, I measured it and it's almost two millimeters of the bearing sticking up proud of the, uh, of the bore. So it's a new one on me. Uh, next thing I'll do is push this up up into place Okay, so So this does just fit down in there um, I did put the nut back on and give it a few tippy taps But uh, fits in and spins nicely now And so to lock that in there I'm gonna take one of these snap rings give it a bit of clean first and you should always have your safety gobbles on when you're putting things back in spring things back in like this I always like to spin them in the bore a little bit to just make sure that they're going to spin. I'm locked in all the way around. Okay, so that's in there. And then the next thing to go in is the seal. I'm gonna drive the seal in and then put the snap ring in. Now this seal, seal's there and you see the spring on the outside that's to keep oil in, so it's facing this way. Sometimes in outboard motors, you'll have an oil seal that way to keep the oil in, and then another one facing like this to keep the water out. But anyway, this one fits down there. And see that orangey stuff? That is the sealant. The old one came out. There was no sealant added to it. It's just an interference fit with a tiny bit of sealant on there. So you don't need to, um, you don't need to add any RTV there. It's not going to hurt anything if you do put a little bit on, but uh, you don't need to. And when you drive it in, for goodness sakes, make sure it goes in straight. Don't, <laughs> don't crook, don't drive it in crooked, and don't nick the rubber seal on any sharp parts here when you're driving it in. So that socket's not big enough. So I did lubricate the shaft a little bit, and I can put a little bit of silicone lube on the lip seal. When you're putting a seal in like that, don't just put it, push it down. Kind of put a little bit of downforce on it and turn the shaft and it just pops over like that there and that way you don't damage anything when you're driving it in okay so that's down there a bit and this socket would be nice if it was just a mill or two bigger but i'm going to be moving it all around this edge as I found that down. It's pretty, it's within a uh, half a mil all the way around. So we're gonna slide our snap ring back in place and I got my finger over it so it's not gonna spring out and get me. Oh, and that's it, right? Drop it into its little groove. I'm gonna put the new gear on top of it. Now the gears are different size. There's a small gear and a big gear. And they're not interchangeable. The small gear won't fit on the big shaft. So, the small gear is going to drop right on there. And after that, there's a snap ring that holds it in place. So, like everything, I'm going to give this a clean and then blow it off. Okay, so this just drops on. 
orientation is not relevant it, as long as the teeth are facing up, but there's no like indexing of the, sh of the gear. And then we need to put a snap ring back in. I bet my lighting's probably not so good anymore for the camera, but I'll do what I can. I always like to just set them in place with the snap ring pliers and then that. I like to make them snap into place and then I just know that it's a positive engagement. I saw it happen and it spins nicely in that little groove. So now that is locked in place. The only thing we have left to do is reinstall this shaft like that with the new gear on it. So I'm going to, I'm gonna wash everything first. Now the teeth damage is minimal. A little bit of scoring right there in the shaft, but it doesn't matter because nothing rides on that. So I'm not at all concerned about it. Here's our new gear, gotta clean that. So the way this works, it's kind of a, it's not complicated, but you gotta put this down in the hole, this through it, and before you engage this all the way into the bearing, you have to get the snap ring on. So, so let's see what we can do with that. Okay, so the shaft is all the way in that bearing, but this snap ring is not yet snapped. You know what I'm gonna say. There, snap. Anyway, it's in its groove, so that's good. So the only thing left here is this bearing to go on there, and I'm gonna give it a little clean. This bearing drops in like that. Insides are all complete. All right, I'm done with snap rings and spacers and driving seals in, and I don't have any spare parts from that part of the project. So that's cool. It's very important when you go to reinstall this that you have this surface clean right here and this little groove. I think that's important too, but I know for sure this is important to be clean because if you go to mount it on the deck, you want this to be flush with the deck. You don't want any debris getting in the way. Also, it's never easier to clean the rust off of the uh, spindle here, so you might as well do that and clean when the blade flits on. So I just do that with a wire brush here. Do that for all three of them and it's ready to go back on. Now there's one trick that I'll tell you. When you go to put this on, remember I told you you've got to put the shafts out of phase, right? So. This one is like this. So this one, I'm gonna put like this. And so when I put this into the splines, and this turns, it's gonna keep those shaft, those blades from interfering with each other. So that's how that goes on. There's another little detail. This is kind of the final piece of this puzzle, is there are bolt holes here, one, two, three, four of them, that go into one, two, three, four there. But there's a little bit of play in those bolt holes. And when you, when you go to attach this to the deck, ideally you would put the bolt holes in, put them in loosely, put them on the deck and tighten them on the deck so that they get the exact angle, you know, like this, this piece to this piece have a refined angle as it's gonna fit nicely onto the deck. If you do that and you get all the bolts in all the way along to all of these, then you're not gonna be stressing the deck and the deck, more importantly, won't be stressing your very expensive gearbox here. So there's a bit of a trick to it because I'm, I'm gonna be giving this back to the fellow that owns the mower and I don't have the deck here and there needs to be, um, you know, I don't mind giving it back to him and saying, hey, tighten these four bolts, but I was gonna use some RTV sealant here uh, because the gasket was ripped and fell apart when I took this apart. But I can't put the RTV sealant on it and give it to him and then have him adjust it. So I'm going to actually get some gasket maker and make a gasket for this. And uh, I'll do that, bolt it all together, bolt it up loose, and then I will send it on its way. I'll also be telling the gentleman that has it, 
that he should be filling the oil level up about to about the top of this shaft right here, the top level of this shaft. Now, these passageways are all connected, and if you fill this one up and those other ones are empty, oil will migrate, uh, you know, this way and fill up the, the gearboxes that are empty. So, um, you know, it may take a couple of hours, days maybe even for the oil to migrate and balance out. You'd want the mower on a level surface. And so that's what I'm going to be telling him to do. Here's a last little tip. Once this cover's on, there is a drain or a fill hole in the cover, but you won't be able to see it once the cover's on. So you need to be able to fill to the top of the shaft. So what I'm going to do is before I put the cover on, I'm going to make a little dipstick. And so basically with cover on, actually I'm going to give that a little millimeter uh, more because cover will raise that a bit. With the cover on, I should be able to do that, pull it out and get oil in the bottom of it. So that's going to be my dipstick for checking the oil level. So I think that is all there is that I'm going to be talking about as far as rebuilding this exploded uh, gearbox. It wasn't a difficult project, but cleanliness is very important and you need a nice work area and some pullers make it easier. Like I've shown you how to use those blind hole pullers and, and sockets of a certain size to tap them in. There's a lot to it. So take your time. Don't get carried away torquing these bolts up and the bolt holes will strip out and you do not want to do that. So be tender when you're tightening these up. If you have to, give, just, just sort of tighten them not too much and then check them later to make sure they haven't come loose. That's my last bit of advice for you. I talked to a Walker dealer and they said 80, 90 gear oil is fine for these. So that's it for now. Good luck with your do-it-yourself projects. And if you like my videos, please subscribe.